Thank you. Uh, my name is Danny Dorling. I'm a geographer who works at the University of Oxford. And I've been asked to talk about um, housing and homelessness in Britain during and after the pandemic, the economic depression that we're in and Brexit with some mention of health. I'll try and do all this in um, just under 30 minutes. Um, this is a personal view of what's been happening in Britain. I see uh, the discussion about housing as, as very often like a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid, we have individual stories about what happens to people. And this is often how acute homelessness, ruthlessness is discussed. Uh, the story of one person, often a young younger man, freezing to death, makes headlines for a day or two and, and then uh, disappears. And very rapidly beneath that original story, you begin to get statistics and people's minds turned off when they begin to hear the numbers and we end up going back to the story again. Now, the pandemic, of course, has been um, really interesting and different, particularly as, a, as concerns acute uh, street homelessness, because very, very early on uh, in the pandemic, in March, April uh, last year, 2020, when we still had projections of 510,000 people possibly dying from this disease. The government instigated an everybody in policy with a lot of help from charitable sectors and so on. And people who were living on the streets were brought into temporary accommodation. That was a great achievement. And it's happened again uh, with later lockdowns. Although it does show what might have been possible before. For instance, the Labour Party had said that if it had won the December 2019 general election, it would try to ensure that within 100 days, nobody uh, was unnecessarily on the streets. And that was poo-pooed, but of course it's possible. But it, but it was also possible because there was empty accommodation. In Oxford, the youth hostel, while the train station was used, backpacker accommodation was used, all kinds of accommodation that wasn't being used for tourists. But also there were other motives at play in hindsight. People are and were extremely scared of this disease. Now, how do you tell young adults that they can't congregate on the street if there are uh, people who are homeless living on the street? And so the, the motives were not entirely altruistic. It was partly because those who were making decisions had the power, had the budgets, were worried about themselves and their chances of getting a disease that they acted in this way. We're in 2021 now. And how are the housing stories going in 2021? Well, they began in January, January the 9th, uh, with a story in The Observer very early on into the new year. The Observer had done a freedom of information request of local councils. And we do have to ask ourselves, why should the, the Observer have to do a freedom of information request of local councils to find out what's going on. We should know what's going on. And what it found was that 70,000, 70,300 households had applied for help to the councils for housing and been deemed eligible to be helped. And this was a period from the height of the first wave, April through to November of last year. A further 50,600 households had been deemed eligible for help to prevent them becoming homeless. And another 86,600 households had been deemed ineligible for any help, having come forward to the local authorities. And of course, there are many, many tens, in fact, hundreds of thousands of people who don't ask the local authorities for help because they don't think they've got a chance or don't know that they can anyway. And the further 73 local authorities didn't even answer the FOI request. And these could have been some of the larger ones, we don't know. But already, because you've heard numbers, thousands of numbers, your kind of brain turns off uh, from, from this. 16th of February 2021, the Resolution Foundation revealed that nearly half a million families across the UK are now in rent arrears because they can't pay their rent because their incomes have fallen due to the pandemic. Furlough, if you're lucky enough to be on it, is 80% of your 
normal wage. But many others have been made unemployed. Uh, many who are working for their own uh, company haven't been recompensed because they couldn't show enough tax records. What the Resolution Foundation found was that almost a tenth of families in the social rented sector are now behind with their payments. 6% in private renting, whereas 2% of people with a mortgage are behind with their mortgage payments. So big inequality in, in this. 300,000 of those households in the private rented sector who are behind with their rent have children. Well over a quarter of all children in England are housed in the private rented sector now. It is precarious, incredibly precarious. Magistrates have not been evicting families from these houses when they haven't paid the rent up to now, but we do not know uh, how they will begin to behave once they are allowed to evict uh, again. A quarter of people working in, or people who are housed in the private rented sector have seen their earnings, earnings fall in the last 10 months. And the six, you've got a mortgage, which is still substantial. It carries on, and maybe this is all obvious to you, but if we look at the proportions of households who entered the pandemic with any savings, of course, households in the private rented sector were much less likely to have any savings when this began, as opposed to other households. And despite calls for forbearance because of COVID-19, only a tiny 3% of households in the private rented sector have been allowed to reduce their rent payments and asking. Almost twice that, 5% have asked and been told, no, you have to keep paying the same rent as you were paying before. Meanwhile, a tenth of households with a mortgage have been allowed to have a mortgage holiday. Although, of course, you know, a mortgage holiday simply defers having to pay off uh, a very large debt. 56% of private rented households that are in trouble are not in receipt of any benefits and so are not eligible for any discretionary housing payments. We have enormous problems, already enormous problems stored up. We are going to come out of this pandemic in a worse situation for housing than the terrible situation we were in when we entered it. And least any of you are not aware of how terrible that situation was, we had the worst homelessness record in Europe before the pandemic began. And some of the most expensive housing on the continent as well. It's a dysfunctional housing system. This has almost nothing to do with supply and demand. Our housing problems are not caused by us not having enough apartments, flats and houses. We've never had more bedrooms per person in this country than we have now. The problem is not caused by people not being allowed to build all over the place. The problem is not caused by large numbers of people coming into the country. The problem is caused by an increasingly inequitable distribution of homes and houses to people. Some people have more and more. They sit in a home where they're the only person and there are four or five bedrooms that are empty in the private sector where they might own or outright, or they might own two or three houses. Others have less and less and we can measure this. And it's all related to our health. At the most extreme end, we can measure the effects on health of people with the least housing. We measure the life expectancy, we know how bad it is. We count ONS, now count, and produce counts for individual local authorities of the number of people who have died while homeless. And ironically, this may, may have fallen in the last 12 months. We will, we will find out. We don't know because being incarcerated in a youth hostel room may not actually be that conducive to health, we will find out. But for the population as a whole, 
the way in which we are, we are housed, particularly the mental health and the precarity and the, the worry of it is not good, but it's very, very hard to measure. It is much easier to measure the effects on breathing and asthma of living in a house that's got damp than measuring the psychological effects of the worry that comes from thinking, can I pay the rent? What is going to happen to me next? But equally as important as this, the reason we have such a bad problem of homelessness, street homelessness, quarter of a million young adults, I think under 25 in London, sofa surfing and so on, is because of the increased inequality in the distribution of housing. That means that apartments that would have been rented out to people who are now on the street are being rented out to people slightly better off because those slightly better off people cannot get into the kind of accommodation that they used to be because somebody else is in that right up to the top of the tree where somebody else is deciding that they need an apartment in the city that's empty uh, at the weekends so that they have somewhere as a bolt hole to sleep but is all that changing will all that change with the pandemic this is this is the interesting question we face now 130,000 people have died more prematurely having had COVID. 130,000 largely elderly people. Uh, a large number in care homes, but a much larger number who were not in care homes. And that will have freed up housing. But as I say, it's not about supply and demand. More importantly, and the estimates are very, very uh, hard to pin down at the moment, but we think that as many as a million people may have left the UK because of the pandemic. Not actually because of Brexit, which is one of the things I said I'd talk about. Uh, but these are people normally resident in another country, often a European country, who could have carried on living here after Brexit. But with the restrictions on travel, with the inability to fly back to Germany or Poland or France or whatever, they've left and they haven't come back. Um, under the pandemic, and you can understand that, but that's estimated to be about a million. On top of that, before the pandemic began, the Institute of um, IPPI, Institute of Public Policy Research, in December 2019 produced a report, I think saying that over 120,000 people had died prematurely because of austerity in old age, again in those age groups most likely to be using up housing. So when it comes to supply and demand, we have less people who need housing now, sadly because of the deaths, sadly because of the emigration. And we have more housing than we had before, but there's no relief. People who hold the housing hold on to it in the hope that its value will be maintained, that they will get what they think they can get from selling it. And most importantly of all, government. Government tries really hard to hold the value of housing up. It has stamp duty holidays. It has helped to buy new, new built housing. It does all kinds of things. It guarantees the loans to banks to try to ensure that housing doesn't become cheaper and more affordable. <laughs> this may sound like a kind of madness, but if the government were to say, we're going to try to reduce the cost of housing so this good for you is cheaper, so that when people who own houses sell them, they don't sell them for as much as they thought they were going to get. Their reaction would be, what are you doing? And if government were to say, we're going to instigate controls on private landlords so that they cannot leave housing empty as easily, there would be uproar because this would be claimed to be the private business of the private landlords. Just take one simple little example. University students in Scotland last year were able to leave their private rented accommodation with a month's notice, take their belongings and go home when they were told by the Scottish government to go home and to study from home and not to study at university. But because the law is different in England, the landlords can carry on charging the students rent 
for housing that they're not in because they've gone home to their parents. And the landlords have no incentive to put anybody else in those homes because they can charge that. It's just a small example of the kinds of things that are allowed to happen differently in different parts of the United Kingdom, which give us a clue as to what we could begin to change if we wanted to begin to change it. But we don't want that. We want the opposite. Or we who are in power want the opposite. Clearest example. When the coalition government came in 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 2010, one of the first pieces of legislation they enacted was to change the rules on the compulsory purchase of property by local authorities, which previously has said that in extreme circumstances, if a property had been left empty and was beginning to become derelict for six months, a compulsory purchase order could be placed on it by a local authority if the local authority could find the money so they could put that property into use. The first thing the coalition government did, the Liberal and Conservative government did, was to change that limit to two years from six months. So that it's much, much easier to leave property empty for longer without the fear that your local democratic institution might get involved and say, look, this is terrible. We can't have a housing crisis and have property empty at the same time. But what happens now? We think that rents are beginning to fall. This is hardly surprising. A million relatively young people having left the UK because of the pandemic, other people not having come in. Many more millions of young people having moved away from what they were renting in cities back to their bedrooms of their parents' houses to work remotely and not to pay the rent, the ridiculously high rents that they need not pay. So things may be beginning to change. We have high streets with boarded up shops which will never reopen because we've got used to buying online again. We have offices, a glut of office space, where as much will hopefully never be needed again because you can work from home half the week. The idea that you have to be present at nine o'clock every day in the office has gone. So we have all this space in the middle of our cities where space is most needed, which could be used in different ways. But that can't be done at the same time as those who own that space, those who own the underlying freehold, maximise their profit with it. What they're hoping for is a V-shaped recovery, uh, back to business as usual, speculators investing in land and the idea that it will somehow reap them a bigger return than the returns they can get from other investments. What they desperately don't want is a social intervention to say, look, we're an aging population, despite all the terrible things that have happened to our health. Wouldn't it make sense to convert some of this space in the middle of cities, which we find that we have now, into housing for people who are more elderly, who can't go up and down stairs anymore, who need lifts, but also need things outside their front door in a relatively short walking distance to go to. This is what you see in other European cities. There will be populations living in the city. Why am I advocating that? Because it would make it easier to then free up the family houses, the three or four bed houses that older people tend to live in. That when we tended to die in our 70s rather than our 90s were vacated early on, but now Many of us carry on living in these large houses on our own for longer and longer and longer because the property value goes up and we can give more money to our grandchildren if we can simply manage somehow to keep on heating a house that's too big for us. And what then happens? Well, the younger couple who would otherwise live in that 1930s free bed semi that the single elderly person lives in, they have to live in a smaller flat that they rent privately and the person who would have lived in that smaller flat is living in an ex-council flat that's been bought in the 1980s by the family and sold on to a private landlord which used to house four people two parents and two children and now houses one disgruntled professional 
and that family of four who would used to have been allocated the place in that council flat are now renting from the private sector somewhere else, somewhere which would have been rented from the person who is currently sitting on the street up in Manchester, freezing. It's all connected. Housing is connected from the richest people at the top through to the poorest people at, at the bottom, bottom. And if you don't see the connections, then you won't see how government are trying to hold up house values for better off people. It's one of the reasons why we have such a high rate of homelessness, as I said, one of the highest rates in Europe. Why should it change now? And how could it change now? And this is what I'll, I'll end on. These trends are long run. The trends in how well or how badly we are housed don't suddenly alter year by year or even decade by decade. Uh, we're about to get a population census, at least in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, just like with housing legislation, it's going its own way. It'll be a year later in Scotland. We're getting the 2021 uh, census in England. My prediction for the 2021 census is that it will show that our housing is the most inequitably distributed that it has been for a century. We don't know. The data won't come out for a year or two, but that's my projection. Why do I think it's going to show that? Because the last census, 2011, showed the most inequitable distribution of housing. The greatest concentration of overcrowding in one part of our housing and under occupancy in the more expensive part of our housing that we had ever measured. And the 2011 census was even worse than the 2001 census, which had been the worst and so on and so on. But has it always been getting worse? And the answer to that is no. The very first census uh, that we uh, measured housing occupancy in well was 1911. And in 1911, it wasn't great, but it got worse to 1921, exactly 100 years ago. In 1921, when we had the big mansions with servants and people living in hovels, uh, often many, many children sharing a bed. 1921 was a peak of housing inequality in the UK. Becky Tunstall in her work at the Housing Research Centre in York has shown this. But after 1921, the distribution of housing became slightly more equal. And the 1931 census showed that. The overcrowding in the very worst slums was reduced, but also the overuse of housing the rich having more houses than they needed, that also reduced in the 1920s after a pandemic, 1918-19 pandemic and also a war after an enormous shock. We didn't have a census in 1941, but by 1951 we discovered we were much, much more equitably housed than we had been in 1921 or 1931. The Conservative government that came in during that decade competed to build more council housing than the Labour government. Majority of children in the 1940s were brought up in a council house. We had social housing as a solution. 1961 census, even better. The rates of occupancy between the worst off tenth of the population in terms of how crowded they were and the best off tenth of the population had got better in the 1950s. The Conservative Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, in 1957, told the population, you had never had it so well, you'd never had it so good. The irony was, he was actually speaking at the height of the 1957 flu pandemic, which shows how things had changed. But he was right about the direction of travel, it was getting better. 1971 census, even better. The large mansions in cities have been split up into separate flats, so they were being used more equitably. Children were beginning to get their own bedrooms in some of the poorer parts of the country, even in 1971, only just beginning. And then 1981, even better. Because the changes in the 1970s 
the building of, of social housing in London, in particular in the 1970s, allowed an even fairer distribution of housing. And then it all changed in the 1980s. And so the 1991 census revealed that we had an increase in inequality in housing for the first time in 70 years. 2001, as I said, even worse, 2011, even worse. And I am absolutely sure that 2021 will be worse. But like a century ago, like 1921, this could and should be the peak. We should change things from here on. We cannot afford the kind of inequalities that we've been living with in the past. It is too terrible an effect on our health, on our worry, on our mental health. And it doesn't even make people who are better off particularly happy. But to change things often requires an enormous shock. And what we have just had and what we're living through now is an enormous shock. We shouldn't see the solution to housing as building. Some building is good. We need some building, but we need more conversion than we need building. And more than building and conversion, we need changes to laws and legislation so that it is efficient to use property in a way that maximises the number of people who are housed and the security of tenure that they have. And if you do that for the population as a whole, if you ensure that people are well housed irrespective of their income, then you will find that those in the most precarious housing situation are better off because there are opportunities for them to be housed as well. And it isn't simply in a pandemic when you're worrying about the spread of a disease that you worry about homelessness. You begin to worry about homelessness much more because you don't take it for granted because you're much less of a dog-eat-dog -dog society when you're told that people who have a lot deserve a lot because apparently they've worked hard for a lot. That way of thinking has to end. Thank you very much for putting up with me.